The honest truth is that uh, politics in Scotland now is much like politics in Northern Ireland. That is that the constitutional question dominates. And if mm. you look at the Holyrood election of a couple of years ago, you know, nearly 90 percent of the people who are current, yes, supporters were back in the SNP and only around 10 percent of no supporters. One of the problems of the opposition is that indeed the public are, to a measure, uh, critical of the health service and, in Scotland and its performance. Um, and it's true of uh, their record in education as well. But the trouble is that doesn't necessarily have cut through. Big question we want to ask today is, has Nicola Sturgeon SM peaked? Scotland's First Minister is certainly under a lot of pressure. She slapped bang in the middle of a huge row about her government's plans to make it easier for people in Scotland to change their gender. That's been blocked by ministers at Westminster. Her popularity, along with the SNPs, has fallen. YouGov poll at the weekend showed support is its lowest for five years. But a bit later on, we'll hear from the SNP and from the former Conservative leader in Scotland, Ruth Davidson, Times Radio colleague as well. But first, I'm joined by Alex Massey, a columnist for The Times. Morning, Alex. Uh, good morning. And we've got uh, Professor John Curtis, politics professor at the University of Strathclyde. Morning, John. Good morning to you, Matt. Uh, it's interesting in particular. Let's just pick through what happened at the press conference yesterday. Nicholas Sturgeon started doing these press conferences every week, uh, it seems. Uh, yesterday she held one where she announced she was publishing her tax returns. Uh, it didn't go entirely according to plan, as the SNP then accidentally released details of her bank account as well. But the briefing was dominated by the case involving Isla Bryson, the double rapist formerly known as Adam Graham, now identifying as a woman. And there were lots of questions there about whether Nicola Sturgeon identifies Bryson as a man or a woman. First Minister, is your gender recognition reform bill dead now? The core of this matter is, is Isla Bryson a woman or not? And if Isla Bryson's not a woman, who makes that decision and on what basis? We've all been asking you, and you've been running away from the question, we have been asking you for days, do you regard Isla Bryson as a she woman? Does. Herself as a woman, I regard uh, the individual as a rapist, and in the context, so the, the context of the prison service, what matters is that uh, the individual was convicted of rape, and that is what we're talking about here, and that's what I will continue to to focus on. That last question that was asked by the Glasgow Herald's Tom Gordon, who uh, had quite a lot of questions to Nicholas Sturgeon. This is impressing uh, the First Minister on another difficult issue. When did you first know your husband had loaned the SNP £107,000? My husband is an individual and he will uh, take decisions about what he does with resources that belong to him uh, in line with that. And uh, I'm standing here as First Minister and that is what I'll answer for. You also talked about internal management of the SNP earlier, so you do talk about SNP matters at these events. When did you first know he'd given that money to the party? I can't recall exactly when I first knew that, but what he does with his uh, resources is a matter for and him. It was wholly his money, any of it yours? It, it, the resources that he lent the party to, uh, to the party were resources that belonged to him. Wholly to him, yeah? They were his resources. None of it was yes, yours, no? Yes, his resources. So, Alex, um, we're not used to Nicola Sturgeon sounding rattled like that. How much pressure do you think she's under? Well, I mean, I think one has to uh, accept that a number of different things can be true concurrently. First, that Nicola Sturgeon is not having a particularly happy time right now. Secondly, this doesn't mean that her position is under uh, any kind of serious threat uh, at present. Um, but there are a number of different fronts in upon which she is struggling. First, there is obviously the fallout from the Isla Bryson case, whereby the Scottish government or the Scottish prison service uh, initially housed uh, a, a double rapist in a woman's prison and not the only uh, serious offender or uh, sex offender to be housed there. Um, secondly, you know, the, you know, and this is a real problem for the First Minister because uh, the mantra trans women are women is all very well and good until you start inquiring, well, what does that mean? Is that the case in all circumstances? Is the, this mantra of trans women are women applicable uh, universally and does it mean that trans people are women in precisely the same way as biological women are hitherto the first minister's line has mm. been yes it is but this case clearly demonstrates i think that some of the concerns raised by her opponents those critical of her gender reforms uh have a good deal of basis in reality um because yeah. managing these situations is not straightforward and against that backdrop, there's a trans There's also the, the state of public services, and not least the NHS in Scotland, seems to be having an impact on public opinion, John. 
Well, I'm not sure that's true, Matt. Uh, the honest truth is that uh, politics in Scotland now is much like politics in Northern Ireland. That is that the constitutional question dominates. And if mm. you look at the Holyrood election of a couple of years ago, you know, nearly 90 percent of the people who are current yes supporters were back in the SNP and only around 10 percent of no supporters. One of the problems of the opposition is that indeed the public are, to a measure, uh, critical of the health service and, in Scotland and its performance. Um, and it's true of uh, their record in education as well. But the trouble is that doesn't necessarily have cut through. Of course, the reason why the, the, the transgender issue is kind of not re what really wasn't the best issue upon which the uh, Scottish government defined itself in a fight with the UK government is that it's an issue where it's pretty clear as a result of the polling over the last year is that those who were advocating reform didn't really succeed in pursuing their case very successfully with public opinion. So what you've got is a parliament, which isn't it isn't just the SNP. I mean, it's the Labour Party, it's the Liberal Democrats, it's also some Conservative MSPs, uh, all of whom backed the bill, uh, whereas public opinion is in a uh, rather different place. Uh, so talk us through what's happened. We saw this YouGov poll at the weekend. Talk us through what the, what those numbers show, John. Well, they sh there, are, there are two uh, headlines. The first is that support for the SNP, both for Westminster and for Holyrood, is at its lowest uh, for five years. Now, there are various things going on there. In part, um, we have to bear in mind that um, the poll also showed that support for independence was down, but only down to back where it was basically this time last year. But uh, given that strong relationship between support for independence and support uh, for the SNP, that's part of what's going yeah. on. Uh, but also it's pretty clear that for whatever reason, and the poll doesn't tell us whether or not is anything to do with gender recognition, but the poll certainly tells us uh, that support for the SNP is markedly lower and, and lower than a couple of other polls that had already shown a decline in yeah. support for independence. Sturgeon herself, um, again, her popularity is down to levels not seen to about five years ago. Now, that means she's got slightly more people who think unfavorably of her rather than favorably of her. And, you know, the truth is that the, the, the history of Sturgeon's popularity is essentially being came in very popular. That gradually dissipated as some of the arguments about the performance the government yeah. kicked in. Then we got towards the 2019 election. Then we had COVID. And, you know, Nicola Sturgeon had a good pandemic. Um, and now that has already been gradually showing signs of easing away. And it's certainly eased away a bit more uh, in the course of recent weeks. But, you know, she is still by far and away... <laughs> the most popular politician in Scotland. That's a good point, John. Just finally then, Alex, what's your sense? Does she survive the year? Does she lead the SNP to the next uh, general election? Are we just getting is it a sort of unionist fever dream to think that, that she's in real trouble? Well, there may be a little bit of that, but, you know, it's notable that Nicola Sturgeon has consistently declined to confirm whether she will lead the SNP into the next Holyrood election, which is due in 2026. You know, lurking behind this is the reality that for most political parties, winning 40 percent support in the opinion polls and that elections is a tremendous result. But for the SNP, uniquely, it's not enough. Because remember, Nicola Sturgeon has pledged to fight the next general election as a de facto referendum on independence. Uh, that means that she and her independent supporting allies in the Green Party need to win 50 percent of the, the vote to claim any kind of mandate for independence. Um, you know, there's a special conference that's uh, been uh, held in March to, to plot a way forward for the SNP as to how it approaches not just the next general mm. election, but the next Holyrood election. You know, so various things are up in the air there. There's a, an undercurrent of discontent within the nationalist movement that thinks that, you know, surely after Brexit and Boris Johnson and Liz Truss and all sorts of other things, that, that you know, independence should be doing better than it is. And so people are beginning to ask, well, why isn't that the case? Yeah. Um, why do we seem to be stuck at 45, 47 percent? support for independence and a little bit less than that for the SNP. So that's the sort of undercurrent of questioning that the First Minister is, is, is enduring at the moment because uh, for the first time some of it is coming from within her own party. It's not just that's really uh, interesting. unionist opponents. Yeah, really interesting that. Alex Massey, really good to speak to you. Alex Massey, Times Economist, thanks very much for joining us. And Professor John Curtis uh, talking us through uh, the polling. But let's hear from two of her former political opponents now. We both take different views on the question. Former Scottish Labour leader Kezia Dugdale was on breakfast with Stig and Asma this morning. And this is what she had to say. Yes, she's had a very difficult week. Yes, I think for the first time in her tenure as First Minister, her 
personal approval ratings have gone into the negative, but most political leaders live with negative personal approving leader uh, ratings for a long time. She's an exception to the rule and has been for a very long time. I actually think the um, the difficulty that she's in over this issue will energise her and, and force her to put her shoulders to the wheel e even further to drive it through because she believes in it. So I think she'll stick at it. One thing she's got is, is resilience, uh, perseverance, and, and she'll get through this difficult period. Kezia Douglas, the former Labour leader in Scotland, she thinks reports of Sturgeon's demise have been exaggerated. Well, I caught up with the former Scottish Conservative leader, Ruth Davidson, and I asked her just how difficult she thinks she thinks things are for Nicola Sturgeon. Well, I, I haven't seen her be put under this amount of internal and external pressure, basically since she took over in 2014, I don't think. Um, which is not to say that, you know, there's an imminent departure happening because... She is in total control of the party. Her husband runs it as the director of the party. She's the head of it. Uh, there's no successor, particularly in waiting. Um, and the way in which you get rid of a leader if they don't want to go is you have the men in grey suits go round and, and chap the door and say, come, come now, time is up. Uh, or you get booted out by the electorate at the ballot box. And, you know, we've not got an election for 18 months and there's, you know, there there isn't a concerted movement within the SNP to oust her. So, I mean, I I think this would be a case of, you know, rumours of her demise are greatly exaggerated. But is this a there's sort of lots of things seem to have come together at once. There's clearly the ongoing frustration from some who wished the the independence had happened by now. There's the extraordinary row, which I'm not even sure she could have expected over the uh, gender reform bill. There's uh. You know, the ongoing problems with the NHS, which, yes, is happening right across the country, but it's, you know, that's firmly at her door. And the sort of divisions both within our party and, and within Scotland that we haven't seen under the sort of one-party state of the SNP for quite a long time. Yeah, I mean, Scotland's got quite an interesting political history in that there are periods where it seems as if there's a one-party hegemony um, that, that looks almost indestructible. And we, we've seen that, you know, when you had... The Tories in the 50s getting, you know, more than 50% of the vote in general elections. Before that, the Liberals did very well. You had, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, Scottish Labour were, you know, just uh, master of all the surveys. You didn't, you didn't count the votes in some parts of central Scotland. You weighed them. Um, and what seems to bring parties down in Scotland actually isn't their opponents. It's hubris. Uh, or at least certainly in, in my lifetime, that's what brought Scottish Labour down, was hubris. And we're we're getting to that point, I think, with Nicola Sturgeon, that she... It's very difficult to tell who her inner circle is, if she has one, who her advisors are, if she listens to them, um, you know, what sort of outreach that she's doing. It It is very much now a case of her party in her own image and, and likeness. And... And I think the GRR bill was quite instructive, not that it, not necessarily because of the position that she took on the issue itself, but the position she took on getting the legislation through the parliament. So, for example, there was an amendment that was laid down by an SNP MSP called Michelle Thompson, um, which would pause the application for a gender recognition certificate for people who were already charged with rape or sexual assault. And, and the reason that this is a kind of important is because a lot of what's happening at now with that case that's crossed the border that people will be uh, aware of, of Isla Bryson, formerly Adam Graham, um, wanting to be housed in a female prison, um, relates to that. Now, Michelle Thompson is not a troublemaker. Michelle Thompson uh, is really on board the SNP party, but also the independence movement. She helped head up Business for Independence. Uh, during the election, uh, during the referendum campaign, she was quite a big figure. She's not a serial rebel. There is no such thing in the SNP. <laughs> she has also spoken movingly in the House of Commons when she was an MP about being raped at the age of fourteen. You know, so this is something that is of deep significance and personal significance to her, and lots of people know her and like her. And the idea that the party was whipped against something like this, that there wasn't allowed to be any sort of consideration. I, I think was really quite telling. There was really no amendments that were allowed to be passed on this, no matter where they came from, even from the SNP's own side. Uh, and there are people within the SNP who have tried to raise issues, not saying we can't have gender reform because, um, you know, they, they believe in that and it was in their manifesto, but particularly on self-ID and particularly on some of the ways in which you can combine making things easier for trans people, um, 
with making sure there is security uh, for women and vulnerable women and women who've been abused and they feel like they weren't listened to. And and that's been where some of the internal difficulties have been for Nicola Sturgeon on this. And on the question of light speculation, mainly from people who are her critics or other supporters about how long uh, she's got, you yourself stepped away from politics when you were the, sort of the top of your game and knowing when is the right place to step away is really tough. I mean, lots of people talk about Jacinda Ardern, but, you know, most most political leaders, particularly if they're in power, uh, are, are sort of dragged out either by the electorate or by their colleagues. Knowing when you've reached the end of the road is a difficult thing to get by, isn't it? Um, it is. I, I think, you know, I, I won't be alone uh, in, in saying that she hasn't seemed happy in a long time, you know, when she when she started. I mean, I mean, she's been in Holyrood since its inception in 1999. She was the deputy leader for 10 years before taking over. She's now been the leader for eight years. I mean, she's been at this a long, long time and has changed over that. And I was a political journalist in Scotland before I became uh, a, a yeah. politician and was in the parliament uh, and going kind of toe to toe with her for 10 years. Um, and I've seen changes in her. And, and you know, the, the kind of, the kind of, way in which she approaches it the energy is different the kind of the, the kind of enjoyment of the combat of politics isn't there and doesn't seem to have been there for a while i mean you see some of these press conferences and and she's she's kind of squabbling with journalists and arguing with them and dismissing them and it's you know there there is a sense a palpable sense and it's remarked upon widely that it's it's as if you know, she cannot be doing with being questioned. And actually, I've always found the cut and thrust of debate one of the best things about politics. I quite I quite like challenge and, you know, and clash and hammering out ideas. Like, that's one of the things that attracts me to it. And and she seems to have somewhere along the line lost that. Uh, and I think that that's quite remarkable. But there's also a sense as well of, do you know, when something's not going right, nothing's going right. So the press conference that she had yesterday um, was designed to move things on, put a bit of pressure on Rishi Sunak. She was going to publish all of her tax returns, you know, and as one columnist in Scotland called it, throwing a dead vat on the table, you know, <laughs> just just move the debate. But what happened was, when they released all the documents, they'd forgotten to take some of her bank details off it. So at the point at which she stood up and did this great thing about, I've released all of my documents, well, well, actually, the party had had to pull them and there was a 404 message saying you can't you can't access them because they realised that her bank account number was still on it. Um <laughs> and, you know, and, and then when the questions came in, uh, she hadn't prepped for some of them. So the answer was, I can't recall when I know that my husband loaned the party I'm ahead of £107,000. But I know it was all his money because it wasn't marital assets, you know, and, and all this sort of stuff. And it's just like, ah, oh, you know, just like that sort of thing didn't used to happen to Nicola because she used to be on top of the comms. If nothing else, like the comms were always, I was going to use a bad word, very hot. Uh, you know, and and sometimes you just you can just sometimes feel it when it's fraying around the edges, and there's a sense in Scotland that's slightly fraying around the edges. But like I say, I don't think anyone should get ahead of themselves. Um, she will go at a time of her own choosing. There is nobody in the SNP and no grouping within it that has the strength or the motivation to to get rid of her. So finally, then, uh, do you think she'll still be there at the end of the year? Will she lead the SNP into the next election? I think those two questions are linked. Um, I think uh, if she stays to the end of the year, she will lead them in to the the next uh, election. I don't think she will do uh, a New Zealand Labour like just in the had, and and she picked up the reins six weeks before general election. Like I, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, there will be a proper and thought through transition, and it will be her person that wins whatever. Um, <laughs> contest there is after it i mean the, the you know the management of the the party management is so brutally impressive it is unbelievable uh you know and and they will make sure that that what they want to happen will happen um but but i can't tell you whether she stays to the end of the year or not um i think that's in the balance Ruth Davidson there, former Conservative leader in Scotland. And, of course, uh, Times Radio presenter. You can catch her on Fridays on Times Radio from 1 o'clock. So let's get the view from the SNP now. And earlier I spoke to Emma Roddick. She's an SNP, MSP for Highlands and Islands. And I asked her if she accepts that Nicola Sturgeon is in some trouble. Well, I mean, it's one poll, and I try not to dig too deep into, into individual polls, but... I do think that saying, you know, we should talk about getting rid of a party leader because she's slightly less well in front of 
every other leader in Scotland in one poll. It's it's kind of akin to you know Celtic fans screaming to sack Ange because they conceded a goal. It's <laughs> it lacks perspective and it's it's obvious nonsense. We're still winning. We've won the last nine consecutive elections. Seven of those were were under Nicola Sturgeon. She's capable, formidable, and I think she's got a lot more left to give. Do you think she's still enjoying it? I mean, I hope so. <laughs> Um, I, I just wondered because I, I thought the press conference yesterday, she seemed to, unusually actually, because I think she's one of the you know the strongest communicators in in British politics. But she seemed a bit, I don't know, testy, a bit unsure of herself, whether it was on the the gender reform stuff or whether or not people could have a drink. I, it, it felt like someone who wasn't still on the top of her game. Well, I mean, I I can't I can't speak for her and, and what she's thinking, but personally, you know, I'm kind of getting a bit exhausted this this month. It is. February, February is always hard, but you know we're we're kind of having the same questions put to us, all of us as MSPs, over and over. Which is not, of course, the fault of the journalists asking because it's still very much public discussion. But I feel I'm repeating myself a lot. I think the first minister is probably repeating herself a lot. Um. So, yeah, testy maybe, but it's it's possibly earned. <laughs> Uh, and in terms of the, the sort of the longer term prospects for independence and for the SNP, um, we've got, you know, clearly the economy is right across the country is not not in great shape. Uh, the health service in Scotland is not in great shape. The education service in Scotland is not in great shape. Nor's public transport. You, know, you can look across a whole range of things. Uh, and actually, you know, sometimes uh, people have been in power uh, long enough. The, the 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 you know whether it's nine ten years um that's you know people run out of ideas they run out of energy they run out of the patience of, of the public i just wonder whether you you're worried if the the sort of the actually not brilliant domestic record of the smp is ultimately harming your hopes of securing independence because the two things seem so intertwined well yeah i would say you know er everyone is struggling at the moment and i mean internationally the uk is struggling and we look at the nhs yes NHS in Scotland needs support and um, the Scottish government is looking at supporting it through you know what's been a very difficult winter so far and um, I expect there will still be challenges going through the next year but it is still performing better than comparable in other countries in the UK this is about reacting to challenges and it's clear when when Scotland has you know the best performing A&Es in the UK something is being done right challenges are being dealt with professionally um, so I, I don't like to get into, oh, you know, has questions around Nicola Sturgeon's leadership, because I think when we saw in the pandemic, she really gained trust in the way she handled running the country. And part of that is is how big a contrast it was to the UK government's handling of the pandemic. But people do trust Nicola Sturgeon beyond those just in the SNP. And we've seen that she has international appeal, international respect. It, it's a bit baffling to me to discuss you know whether it's it's time for her to go based on on one poll which still puts her well in front of everyone else <laughs> um so finally then i know you, you just said you get irritated by a leadership question i've got to ask what one final one how confident are you that nicola sturgeon will lead the smp into the next general election um i'm, I'm confident in that um i'm more concerned that, that she leads us into independence because i think she'll be the leader who who does that for the smp that was Emma Roddick, uh, SMP, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Before that, we heard from Ruth Davison, former Conservative leader. Of course, Times Radio presenter. Uh, Kezia Dugdale, former Scottish uh, Labour leader. Uh, John Curtis and Alex Massey as well.